ITU Bilim and Bilim ve Teknoloji Zirvesi konuşmaları serisi. This is our sixth uh, talk by distinguished guests. And the first one was by Yasser Abu Mustafa and I was there and it was again on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Today also we have our distinguished guest, our speaker, El Hussein Fevzi. He is a research scientist at Google DeepMind in London. I guess people in AI know what DeepMind is. Working on making machine learning system more robust. He received his master's and PhD degrees from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL, Switzerland, and spent one year as postdoctoral scholar in computer science department at UCLA. He received twice the IBM PhD fellowship around the world. They, they were mastermind of the summer school and they organized it. It was a very successful one. Many people from especially Africa attended that and I was there with two of my. But let me tell you about that. We decided that we are going to have second summer school in Istanbul and in technical of Istanbul next June which will be followed by an artificial intelligence summit. And we are organizing that and we invited him to come over to discuss that organization and while he is here, he was very nice to accept to give a talk here as a part of our seminar series. So please take the podium. Thanks a lot, Dawood. Thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, it was working one minute ago. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's really uh, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first time to Istanbul. Uh, we arrived uh, on Saturday, and uh, we're, we're really having a very, very exciting time. Uh, so I'm looking forward to our... Uh, that basically works on fundamental problems in AI. Uh, so uh, it's most famous for, for example, uh, solving uh, AlphaGo, or solving Go, the problem, the, the pro the, the problem of Go. Uh, and uh, recently it's been uh, tackling uh, fundamental problems in science, such as protein folding and so on. So uh, my, re my research area is more into security of machine learning, which is going to be what I'm going to present today, uh, and how to basically make uh, machine learning more robust and uh, applicable in the real world environments. Okay? So, uh, as, you, as you all know, uh, uh, deep, uh, machine learning has been uh, a re recent success in many areas, uh, from uh, image classification to image captioning to speech recognition uh, to playing complex games like the game of Go and StarCraft and so on. So we've been able to reach uh, amazing accuracies in the last few years. Um, so for example, in the task of image classification, where the goal is to uh, detect what is in the image or to, to classify basically what is in the image, um, we've been able to uh, go from like more than 25% error rate on a, on a very, very complex data set, including like uh, millions of images and thousands of labels, to less than 5% error rate in, in 2015, which is on, on par with what the human is actually able to do on this very, very complicated task. Okay, so we've really witnessed immense success in the last few years, thanks to uh, different components, uh, algorithms, but also increase in the compute power, uh, hardware, and so on. Now, the underlying, uh, behind this success, there is really uh, a key word, which is the deep neural networks. And deep neural networks have been really uh, beating most ba or all baselines uh, in machine learning in the last few years. So let me just maybe just say a few words about deep learning if you're not familiar with it. So deep neural networks are these uh, architectures, basically, that take as input, let's say here, an image. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about vision. So we're going to take uh, as input an image, and then, um, and then basically, a 
deep networks are building this successive represent or like um, progressive representations uh, through elementary nonlinear operations. So basically, you you have uh, first uh, uh, some some nonlinear operation and then another nonlinear operation, so on and so forth. And what you have is basically a more and more abstract representation. So in the first layer, what you'll get is basically an edge representation of your image. Okay, and then as you go deeper and deeper your network, you're going to get more and more abstract. So you're going to get like contours and uh, junctions and so on and so forth. Till at the end of the of the deep neural network, you're going to get something that is abstract that is actually going to represent what is in the image. Okay, so for example, here is going to uh, to, to to tell you that this is actually a dog. Okay, so Samoyed is a t type of dog. Okay, so it builds this by the, with this elementary operations like for example convolutions and rectified linear units uh, and max pooling and so on and so forth. And really, the idea behind the different successes, whether, whether that's medical imaging or, uh, or speech recognition and so on, really rely on these um, um, building blocks. Uh, obviously, there is some difference in architecture. So, for example, this is a con convolutional neural network. In, in, uh, in medical imaging, you would use, for example, a UNet architecture. But again, the main idea is, re is really roughly the same. And uh, it's this uh, idea of compositionality, of composing basically different elementary operations together, building more and more abstract features uh, with your deep ne neural network. OK? Uh, now, um, so uh, the, the task of learning, so we always talk about deep learning, so the task of learning a neural network is basically that you're giving some data and then you want to learn the parameters of this, of this neural network. Okay? So for example here we want to learn the filters of the convolutions. Okay? So um, this will determine precisely what is going to be the input-output mapping. Okay? So, uh, what we, so what we usually have, what, what does the deep training a deep network consist in? We're basically going to find the parameters of the network in such a way to minimize the number of mistakes on a training data. Okay? So we usually have like, uh, uh, big training data. For example, in this image net example that I was giving, it's like million, uh, around a million image labeled. Okay? So e for each image, you have the associated label. Uh, and you're going to find the parameters of the neural network in such a way to cause basically the minimal amount of uh, mistakes on the training data. Okay? So you're going to try to minimize the number of uh, mistakes on the training data. Okay? Now, I, I want to emphasize about the fact that machine learning is not about memorization. It is really about generalization. Okay, so what does this mean? It means basically that we are not training deep neural networks in order to minimize the number of mistakes on the training data. We don't care at the end of the day about the training data. What we care about is that it generalizes to data points outside, um, outside um, the training data, what we call the test data. Okay? Uh, the, the, we, like if we train it on cats versus dogs, then we really want it to, uh, to generalize to other cats and other dogs. Okay? Um, and uh, so recent deep neural networks really contain about 100 million parameters and are trained on, on, on like millions of annotated images. So it's really big beasts that we're, that we're considering here. Despite the fact that these are extremely big, at the end of the day, the, the, the methods that we use are actually very simple. We're, we're, we're using like gradient descent, which probably you have heard about. Uh, so these are extremely simple techniques to optimize, okay, to basically find these parameters that lead to a to, um, that, that leads to to, um, to a minimum amount of training uh, training errors on the on the training data, uh, and basically it consists in following the derivative. Okay, so it's not something much more complicated than this. You have a you have a loss function, and then you want basically to to minimize your loss functions. So you just follow the derivative till you basically arrive to uh, a local minimum. Okay, so the optimization techniques are actually very very simple that we're using. Okay, so. With great inventions come great responsibilities. Okay, so if we if we um, we have like people have invented these deep neural networks and we want to deploy these in real world environments. Um, so if we deploy these in real world environments, we really need to make sure that they are robust to some extent and they are they can accommodate different uh, uh, perturbation scenarios, especially if we implement these in real world environments and in um, like safety critical environments like uh, aircraft and so on. Okay, so. Uh, what do I mean by basically being robust to perturbations? So let's say, for example, you have an image here that is representing a lampshade, okay? So, um, and then you perturb it just a little bit. I'm, I'm just showing you a toy example here. So you perturb it with a geometric transformation, okay? And then you're going to basically try to classify this perturbed image, okay? 
Now, you want the perturbed image to be classified in the same way as the original image. Okay? So this is a very simple notion of uh, robustness that we want to achieve. Okay? Uh, and you really want to uh, achieve this if you are to deploy these things in real-world environments. So here I showed the geometric transformation, but you might actually think of many different transformations and perturbations. You can think about adversarial perturbations, where you have a malicious agent that basically tries to add the minimal amount of noise to your image in such a way to basically cause data misclassification. Okay? So this is an adversarial, because you have someone that really tries to find the worst-case noise. You can have also random noise. In other applications, we care about random noise. And in more computer vision applications, we care about geometric transformations, occlusions, illumination changes, and so on and so forth. Okay? So depending on the application, you might want to achieve robustness to one of them, several of them, or maybe none if, you're not, uh, if you don't care about this. But usually you have to care about this. Um, okay, so despite the fact that deep neural networks work extremely well, and I think most of us are convinced about this, state-of-the-art deep networks are extremely vulnerable to adversarial perturbations. Okay? So what do I mean by this? So this is an image of a school bus that is correctly recognized by the deep neural network as a school bus. Okay? And this is an image that the deep neural network thinks is an ostrich. Okay? Now, you might not see any difference between these two, and you're completely right, except that I have added a very small perturbation here that is imperceptible to the human eye in order to cause, basically, data misclassification, in order to cause this thing to be misclassified. Okay? So what I've done here is that I try to find a, a very small perturbation that is imperceptible to the human eye. I added this to this image of a school bus that is correctly recognized by the deep network as a school bus, and it led to a complete misclassification. This, it thinks that it's an ostrich. Okay? So this thing is not a random noise. This thing, I really built it, I really built it in such a way that to cause, basically, data misclassification. You might tell me, OK, maybe this is something very specific for this image that you've chosen and so on. Actually not. I can, I can do this for any image that you want and I'll find you an adversarial perturbation that is imperceptible that will lead to the same problem. You might tell me, maybe this is a problem between school bus and ostrich, maybe there is some sort of relation between school buses and ostrich, I don't know. Uh, but actually, no, I can basically tell you, I can basically map this to anything you like. Okay? So you can give me your label and I will just map it to anything you like. You might tell me, I don't know, this perturbation is like weird and so on. I will actually show you in, the, in this presentation that I will find very, very simple perturbations that will lead to the same misclassification problems. Okay? So why, why should we care? Now, at this point, you might be surprised what is happening here. Okay, it's cool. But uh, wh wh why should we care, right? I, I'd like to show you some applications in which this thing is really, really problematic. Okay? So the first application I want to talk about is basically medical imaging. Okay? So um, suppose that you have the task of basically uh, saying whether an image is uh, from a healthy patient or from a, uh, 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 from a um, patient that has a condition. Okay? So for example, let's say you're doing uh, the x-ray of the chest of a patient, okay? and you have a deep neural network that correctly recognizes this image Okay, as a healthy patient, and this image as an unhealthy patient. Okay, so this probability here is the probability that this patient is unhealthy, so it's very small, so it's good. And this probability uh, is basically the, the probability that this patient is unhealthy. So it's very large, so it's good. Okay? Now, that's the first row here. Okay? Now, I've added this very small perturbation on this image. Okay? And you might not see any difference between this one and this one, and you're right. And now the probabilities are completely flipped. So the, the, the deep neural network is now, now thinks that this guy is uh, unhealthy with a very high probability, and is this guy is healthy with a very high probability. And this is really, really problematic. You can do this for X-ray, you can do this for dermoscopy, you can do this for any modality that you actually uh, can think of. This is problematic from two, two points of view. The first one is really that if we if we, um, if we use um, medical images, we really want to, our classifier to output interpretable decisions. Okay? So we don't want a doctor that just you know, like, uh, uh, randomly labels uh, healthy, unhealthy, and so on. We really want the, the decisions to be uh, based on true facts, on true things in the image, right? on true uh, features in the image. And this is clearly not the case, because you could change something like a no some noise, and basically it causes complete misclassification. 
The second uh, problem is, is uh, you can imagine many ways in this can break completely insurance uh, companies and so on, right? So uh, people, healthy people can get uh, uh, reimbursement um, for being unhealthy, and unhealthy people will not get reimbursement for being healthy and so on. In, to, to, in tomorrow's uh, world where we have uh, this kind of uh, automated decision-making of whether a patient is healthy or not. Ah. Okay, now the second application I'd like to share with you, uh, let me just keep track of the time. Okay. The second application I'd like to share with you, which is uh, autonomous vehicles, okay? So uh, I, I don't think it's very hard to convince uh, that, uh, to get convinced basically that uh, if we, if we uh, have this problem of robustness, autonomous cars might actually fail completely in the sense that uh, you might take a, 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 a stop, this, this sign, for example, of a 100 a speed limit, and then you might add a very small perturbation on top of it, and the autonomous car thinks that it's a completely different sign. Okay? And this is actually an experiment done on real cars. Okay? So you, basically here it, it thinks that it's 120 kilometers per hour, whereas actually it's 101 because a very small perturbation have been added physically on top of this, on top of this uh, um, uh, uh, speed limit sign. Um, uh, beyond classification, you might th like there is really problems also from a tracking perspective. So let's say, for example, that you want to get away from a tracking system that basically um, automatically tries to track you. Okay. Uh, and what, uh, uh, what you can do, actually, if you want to get away from this, you can actually design a uh, specific, uh, feature, a specific like, um, um, pattern here, which is shown in the screen, that basically makes the, 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 um, uh, the focus of, the tar of, the, of this track of this tracking system uh, get completely lost the, the, the person, okay? So uh, what you can see here is that uh, basically this person can get away from the tracking system very easily by, uh, by, by, by designing this pattern, this very specific pattern, and, and putting it on the, on the screen here. So here what you have is basically a drone that tries to, um, to follow the person, and so the, the drone obviously relies on this tracking mechanism in order to basically know which, which angle it should, it should put it itself at, um, and if you basically get, uh, get, uh, fool the system with such a simple pattern, then you might get, you might basically, uh, the, the drone might get completely in a wrong place, right? And this is exactly what's happening here. Okay, so now a few applications why, why, this, is, why, why this is problematic. So I, I've shown a few applications really from a safety perspective that really I think um, are, are problematic for, uh, uh, from, yeah, from a safety perspective. But I also want to highlight about the fact that uh, the reason, one of the reasons why I actually worked in this field is that there is a very uh, close relation between analysis and, and uh, robustness of deep neural networks. So deep neural networks are, are thought of as, as, uh, as black boxes currently. So by studying the robustness property of deep neural networks, we have a much better understanding of the internal mechanisms and in particular, the geometric uh, internal mechanisms of deep neural networks. And this is the um, this is a more scientific part. So this is really will involve some mathematics and so on. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so the outline of the talk, uh, hopefully, is going to be like uh, in the first part. I'm going to tell you how can you actually fool your network. So we saw that you know, like it's. It is possible to fool your network, but we didn't see how you can fool your network. Okay, so I'll tell you about this, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll explore some um, um, uh, some ways basically to make your network more robust. So I should mention that this is still an open problem. Okay, uh, but yeah, so I'll mention some um, ways that, that you can improve your robustness. So uh, this part now is going to be more uh, mathematical, obviously. So um, we, we really have to go into the mathematics a bit more if we are to, um, to develop these two points here. Okay. Okay, so the first part, how to fool your network. So assume that you have basically your image. Uh, which is basically x. Okay, so x is going to uh, the image basically is going to be a point in this high-dimensional space, the, the, the space of pixels. Okay, uh, so we're going to have a two-class classification problem. There is like class one and class two. So for example, cats and dogs. Okay, so each point is just an image, and then uh, the decision boundary, this thing here, is going to be what 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 separates what separates basically 
cats from dogs, okay? Class one, class two. Um, and then uh, what we call an adversarial perturbation is the minimal perturbation you need in order to go from X, from this data point here, to the other class, okay? So it's this vector here, R star of X, okay? So if we write this mathematically, what I, what I have is basically that the robustness to adversarial perturbation is going to be defined in this way here, okay? So it is the minimal perturbation, okay, R, such that my classifier at, K, at X plus R is different than the classifier at X, okay? So I'm trying to find the minimal perturbation in terms of an LP norm, here L2 norm, such a way that I add it to the image, original image, and I cause basically data minus classification, okay? Is it clear? Yeah? Okay. And then if I want a global measure across all my data points, I can basically take an expectation of this quantity over all data points, okay? Because this is data specific. Okay, so now I have the problem of basically trying to solve this problem, right? So I try to solve basically this uh, optimization problem, okay? This constrained optimization problem. So uh, this constrained optimization problem is rather difficult because this is a this is a deep net and this is a deep net, right? So I mean this is this involves very nonlinear functions in the um, in the constraints. So uh, let's assume that the, the classification region look like, looks like this. So x is the same as before, okay? Uh, and then basically this is the this is the the, the region where I'm classified correctly, okay? So I, and then I'm trying to go basically outside this region. Remember that I want to find the minimal perturbation that goes outside this region. So what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm going to basically linearize this data point around my current... Uh, I'm going to linearize the decision boundaries around, around the current data point. And then once I linearized, I can basically compute in closed form the distance from this data point to the linearized decision boundaries, okay? So I can really, I can really like compute this new data point in closed form because I have now an, a, a linear decision boundary. And then I linearize again around my new point, okay, x1. And then I iterate basically till I get a data point that goes outside the classification region that I care about, okay? So in practice, if you do this for deep neural networks, you actually do require around two, three iterations max in order to go outside the, the, the decision or outside the classification region of the original uh, deep, nonlinear deep neural network, okay? And this is a technique that we introduced in 2016 um, uh, that is quite popular now in order to fool basically deep neural networks. And if you have a GPU, you can run this in very, very, very quickly and you will fool your classifier um, um, very easily, which will result in this image that I showed in the first slide. Uh, now, since, since we proposed this, there has been a huge amount of work on, uh, on proposing different defenses. Um, uh, and um, you have now like uh, leaderboards and benchmarks that basically try to uh, evaluate how good is your, how robust is your model uh, and, um, you know, across different, uh, uh, different um, attacks. Um, so this is, for example, one of them. And it scores basically the different models here in terms of the different attacks. And the, the main takeaway here is that fooling a model is actually extremely simple. So uh, really everything that kind of is kind of smart that you try works to fool your model. So fooling a model is actually very simple, okay? Um, so it's, it's, it's really not the hard part. Just imagine any kind of gradient-based optimization technique and you will basically get, uh, uh, get a fooling, uh, very high fooling accuracy. Okay, so at this stage, we, were, uh, we, were, we thought, okay, so, you know, like we had a, um, uh, an adversarial perturbation for each image, okay? So remember that you had to solve this optimization procedure for each image. You want to fool a, a, a classifier on a specific image, you need to solve this optimization technique. So we had this crazy idea of like, okay, can we actually find a single perturbation for all images, a single pattern for all images, in such a way that I'm going to add this kind of like weird pattern on the image of a joystick, it will become a chihuahua. And then I'm going to add this image, th this perturbation on that of a flagpole, and it will become a Labrador. And I will add this one again to the image of a balloon, and it's going to become a terrier, okay? So like, can we really find a single magical perturbation that you add to everything, and it's just going to fool everything? And as, as crazy as this might sound, yes, you can actually find a single, what we call universal, because it fools everything, perturbation that fools all, uh, uh, your classifier on all images. 
And uh, I will just highlight very quickly how you can actually find a, such a perturbation. Um, so, uh, so assume that you have, again, like data points x1 to xm, which you want to, which you want to, to fool. So these are your training points. Okay? Uh, and then you basically want, so this is the classification region associated to x2. This is the classification region associated to x1 and so on. So you want to, go to find a vector, basically, that goes outside uh, all these different um, regions. Right? So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to assume that these things are on top of each other. It's just a thought experiment. Okay, and then the idea is really, really simple. So you just add, you just find a perturbation that goes outside the first region. Okay, so note that this perturbation here goes outside the first region, R1, but it doesn't go outside the second region and the third region. So what do you do? Well, you do the simplest thing. You just add a perturbation that you, know, you add the increment in such a way to go outside of the second region. Okay, now this sum of these two things, which is this goes outside of the first one and the second one, but it doesn't go outside the third one. So what we're going to do again is basically iterate over this and add a perturbation that goes outside the third region, and so on and so forth. So if you do this on a training set, on a large enough training set, you will find this kind of weird perturbations that fools all different images on your, uh, for your classifier. OK, so this is, for example, this is a perturbed image. You might not see any perturbation, because this is, weird. This is actually a very, very small perturbation. Uh, so this, uh, the state of the art net thinks that this sock is actually an Indian elephant, and this is wool, this is Indian elephant again, and so on and so forth. These are images that I've taken myself with, with a cell phone camera. Okay? So this is not something that's specific to the data set I'm trying to use or anything like that. This is really something uh, generic. Okay, this is like, uh, you can do this for different, uh, for different networks, and basically each time you get a different um, um, kind of uh, structure, which is interesting to study. Uh, we, we still actually don't have a very good understanding about why these are like causing such a failure. Because like these look like a artistic or, you know, like they have a very textural patterns. Uh, so it's, it's, it's still unclear why such perturbations really cause that, that much of a misclassification. Um, okay, so and then we want to, 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 to go even further. So we said, okay, we, we, the, it's easy to break it with a universal perturbation. Can we break it with a very small dimensional uh, transformation? So for, in particular, a geometric transformation. So uh, in this case here, we were not, um, we're not fi finding an additive perturbation, but a transformation, a small enough transformation in order to cause misclassification. So for example, translations, rotations, and so on. In this case, we obviously have, have to adapt the distance measures and so on in order to, uh, to make sure that we, we account for rotations and translations and so on. I won't go into the details for the sake of time, but uh, the, the main takeaway is basically that uh, you can find very small transformations, like for example this to this, uh, in order to basically cause again data misclassification, even though it's actually very small dimensional. Okay, so you're trying to find like four uh, parameters, for example, for a similarity transformation. Okay, so it seems that uh, neural networks are broken in a way, in the sense that we can make uh, networks fail completely by adding very small perturbations on top of the images. So in this second part, I want to basically try to highlight um, one or like the most uh, famous approach in order to make to try to make neural networks robust. This is far from ideal, and it doesn't work very well yet. Okay? So this is still a very open research area. So if you're working on this, in, in, if you're a PhD, and you're trying to find a subject, I think this is a very, very exciting subject to work on. OK, so, why, what, okay, so unlike, unlike, uh, unlike um, uh, attacking, finding defenses is actually a very, very difficult task. And the reason why it's very difficult is that you're actually trying to defend against all possible attacks. You're not just trying to defend against one attack, right? One optimization method. You're trying to defend against everything, right? Uh, because you cannot just assume that the attacker uh, is just, you know, uh, is go just going to use one type of optimization method. You really want to, you really have to assume that the attacker is smart. If this doesn't work, he will try something else, and so on. So you really need to, to kind of like draw, to have a ball, a security ball around your data points in such a way that any perturbation you will actually be correctly classified. Okay, um, and this is really the hard thing about this problem, right? You need, you need to certify that you are robust against everything. Okay. Um, 
and and in this and, and this really has led to a kind of uh, a lot of speculation about this area that people thought that they found defenses but they were actually not defenses okay so there's been a lot of you know like back and forth between papers that say okay we find the best we found the best defense that basically um, gets rid away of this problem and then you have other people these two pa ICML papers for example saying actually these papers that you just this defense these defenses that you just proposed are not proper defenses here's a way to attack them okay and then you have other people saying okay actually no they are, these are proper defenses and so on so you have a back and forth between uh, basically people proposing defenses and people proposing attacks okay and and, and recently there's been a huge amount of of uh, papers uh, basically trying to attack Trying to, attack, trying to attack basically defenses, or like quote-unquote defenses, showing basically that defenses, the defenses that have been proposed are not proper defenses. So you can, see, you can think you know, like of this as a, you know, like a race between these two, these two uh, uh, communities here, which leads obviously to uh, many problems in the reviewing and so on, as you, as you might imagine. Um, okay, so... The, like the, there is one exception, I think, and the, really the, the best method that currently works is actually a, a simple method. Uh, it's it's called adversarial training. Okay, it's not like perfect, as I said, uh, but it is like providing some clues. So adversarial training is this uh, strategy where what you do is that instead of training on your uh, samples, your original samples, you're actually going to train on perturbed samples. Okay, okay, so. Uh, Let's say you have an image X here, okay? Instead of feeding it to your network and then updating the, the weights uh, based on this gradient that you just computed, what you're going to do is that you're going to compute an adversarial perturbation here, okay? And then you're going to feed X plus R, the perturbed image, to the network, and then you're going to update the network based on this perturbed image, okay? And then, at the next step, you're going to compute adversarial perturbation for the current network that you just updated, okay? So it's an online mechanism, Okay, where uh, at each step you are going to compute an adversarial perturbation, add it to your training data, update the weights based on uh, the, this, this, uh, this perturbed training data, compute adversarial perturbations for the, new, for the next one, and so on and so forth. Okay, you based on the current network. Always based on the current network. So there are two things that make this work. The first one is the online way of doing it, okay? So you cannot just uh, compute adversarial perturbations for, a, for an old network or something like that. You really have to, at each step to compute an, a, an adversarial perturbations for the current network, which really makes it an online, an online algorithm. The second one is that you really need to compute strong perturbations. You need to com compute, uh, you, you need to optimize, to solve this optimization problem uh, well enough, right? You cannot just do one gradient step or something like that. You really need to do, let's say, 100 gra gradient steps or something like that. You need to have a strong attacker. So it's a game basically between an attacker and a defender, and you really need the attacker to be strong enough. Strong enough and online. Okay? So this, uh, if you apply this adversarial perturbation mechanism, you, uh, d okay, so that's basically the normal uh, adversarial accuracy. So basically this means that you, c you can fool 100% of your uh, images on, on a data set that we call CIFAR, CIFAR 10. Okay? Now, if you do adversarial training, you ramp up this adversarial accuracy from 0%, so basically fooling everything, to basically fooling half of the data points. Okay? And this is, this is pretty much the state of the art that we have currently. So it's not great. We just reduced the, the, the problem by half. Uh, but still, it's, it's, something, it's something, right? And nobody can really attack uh, this. So if you, if you are like a really good attacker, I suggest you to download one of these models and try to attack it. If you, if you, if you can attack it, then you'll be, you'll be very famous. Okay? Um, there, is, there is a problem, basically, uh, also, uh, besides the fact that it doesn't work that well, there is a problem which is that it's actually very computationally heavy. If you're Google, you can basically do this, but if you are not, then, you know, like, you really need to solve this internal optimization method at each uh, iteration. You need to, to solve this internal optimization problem at each iteration, okay? So, at each iteration, instead of updating your weights based on the data point X, you need to solve an optimization problem. And this takes time, right? Um, so especially if you do like 100 or 200 epochs or something like that, this really takes time. So um, this is really far from ideal. So, um, it, um, so one way to, to um, 
So what we, what we did basically uh, to make it more efficient is that we said, okay, let's study, the geom let's study a bit the scientific aspect of this and let's study the, the geometric decision boundaries of deep neural networks, how do, how do they look like, and then let's try to mimic this, the effect of adversarial training through a simple and more efficient way basically. So if you, like, to, to give you a bit of a flavor about what this looks like, uh, this is basically the decision boundary of a deep neural network for a normally trained network. When you train normally, okay, you have things like this. So this is class one, this is class two, and this is your data point. And this is basically a cross section. Okay, so I took a, a random cross section of your, uh, of your very high dimensional space. This it looks basically something like this. Now, after adversarial training, you can see two differences between uh, normal training and adversarial training. So the, the first one is that the distance from the data point to the decision boundary has increased, which is something good because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do, right? We want to increase the robustness. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the, the curvature of the decision boundary has significantly decreased. It's, it's much less wiggly, right? And this is the, the part that really gets interesting here. Um, what we are going to do is that we're going to... Uh, um, to optimize, to say to the network, basically, without doing all this adversarial training stuff, we're going to tell it, okay, let's just try to find networks that have decision boundaries that are rather flat, okay? And that's where we will get the efficiency part. Okay, so I showed this on the decision boundary, but you can do the same thing basically on the loss function, which is basically a, a, function, of, a function with respect to, to the inputs, okay? Uh, and this is basically showing the negative of the loss function. And like this is before adversarial training, that's the after adversarial training. So what you see is that in the beginning, the curvature is very high. And as you train it uh, with adversarial training, the, the curvature of the, of the loss function gets, gets smoother and smoother. Okay? Okay, now this is, the, this is some uh, qualitative aspects of this. Now, can we actually try to verify this, this fact that after adversarial training, the curvature of your decision boundaries of the, and the loss function gets smaller? And yes, you can do this by measuring, by computing the Hessian, which is basically the second order of your loss, the second order derivatives of, of your loss function. Okay, so this is going to be a matrix of size the number of pixels by the number of pixels. And then the eigenvalues of this, of this Hessian is actually going to be what we call the curvature, okay? And uh, if you actually plot the, the curvature of your uh, loss function, what you get is the following for the original train network, okay? And then after adversarial training, you get something much more squashed, much smaller, in the sense that after adversarial training, you get a uh, much smaller curvature. And this is the quantitative um, verification of the statement, of the, of the qualitative statement that I was just talking about. So, at the end of the day, what we do is, is rather simple. Um, so if you basically have a standard training, like this is the, the standard training procedure. You have a loss function, you're trying to minimize your, your, uh, your, uh, your sum of loss functions over training data, uh, um, and the parameters theta is what you're optimizing for, the xi's are the data points. Instead of doing this, what we are going to do is basically to add a regularizer that going to, is going to say, okay, I want actually the curvature of my, uh, of my loss function with respect to the inputs as small as possible, okay? And if you do this, um, what you get is the following. So that's, that's basically the normal network, okay? So the accuracy on the clean samples is, is 94%. Adversarial accuracy, as, as I just said, is 0%. You can fool everything. With adversarial training, you get this. Okay, and with uh, what we call cure, which is basically curvature regularization, you get something very, very close to adversarial training, but much faster um, and much more efficient, basically. This is basically CVPR 2019. Now, we, we have a very recent paper where basically we can outperform adversarial training a bit, uh, not by too much, but a bit, but with this very efficient uh, algorithm. Um, so, the, the really, the, the conclusion of this is that um, is that adversarial training, this complicated procedure, is actually very much, um, um, basically has a one-to-one -one mapping with this reduction of the curvature. Uh, and this is something that actually we would want to include in our training mechanisms uh, as we go forward if we are to, to, to improve the robustness of deep neural networks. Okay, so I have, I guess, a few minutes left. I um, don't want to, to, to make it too long. Um, so, um, so wh what I showed basically is that uh, it's very easy to fool networks. It's, it's still an open problem 
to, to make it a, a robust, to make your network robust to perturbations. And what we see in the community is that there is really, a, uh, like, the people are really becoming more and more aware of this. Um, so in the near past, what people used to do, if, you, if, they are to, if they had to deploy machine learning systems in the wild, what they would do is to test it on a validation set. It works on the validation set. Let's just deploy it, right? Now there is this um, extra step, at least in some companies, that basically consists in, okay, we have to actually test for the robustness of the deep neural network more rigorously, right? And so we'll try to attack it. Um, in the best way and so on, okay? And use the state-of-the-art attacks and what I just presented before. And um, I think that if we are to, as I said, this is an open problem, if we are to tackle this problem uh, in, the, in the near future, because that's really, I think, a very fundamental problem, uh, we have to do, uh, like, we have to collaborate better between different communities, um, because, like, this has a lot of flavor with robust control, uh, with risk analysis and so on. So, for example, if you are to deploy a, uh, a nuclear power plant, then you really have to do some risk analysis. You have to evaluate the probability that this structure will fall uh, if you have an earthquake of, you know, like, um, magnitude X, right? So you really need to do this. And we have to do the same thing, the same things with our machine learning um, uh, methods, which we don't have tools for currently. Many people think of machine learning as software 2.0, so software 1 would be basically correspond to coding in Python and coding in C++ and so on. Software 2 corresponds to providing the training data, and then the, the code would basically be the weights of your network, right? And uh, the, 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 you would just use the learning mechanisms in order to, uh, to learn these weights. So the weights would actually not be interpretable at all. So just like with, when, we, when, we, uh, when we put a, uh, so, uh, software in an aircraft, we really ha this has to, go under, to undergo uh, 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 you know, like many different steps of validation. Um, we have to also do the same thing for software 2.0, which is, which is really machine learning. Okay? We have to develop the right tools to validate and to give a stamp basically on the fact that this uh, this machine learning uh, software is actually robust to the different things, to the specifications that we care about. So I've talked a, a, a lot about robustness of deep neural networks, and this is just one part of a bigger field, which is the safety of machine learning. So uh, there is a there is other parts to it, and most notably, there is the deep fix, which, which you probably uh, have heard about. So deep fix is this technology uh, where you can basically make everyone say everything about anything. Okay, so uh, you can basically uh, take Obama and make him say anything that you would like to, to like him to say, and you can basically fake everything. Um, so, for example, what you have here is. Um, what you have here is uh, this, this original video, okay? And then this lady has been, um, uh, like her photograph has been used basically to, um, on top of the face of this, uh, of this lady here. So, so when you see this video, you think that this one is actually the one performing the video, while, while this, she never actually has performed this video. It's actually this lady has, who has done it, okay? So you can do this with videos, but you can do also this with, uh, with audio and so on. And this has really, this is really, I think, quite easy to see why it will raise issues. And in particular, uh, like in the last month or so, probably m many of you have already seen this article, but I, I found it rather uh, interesting that thieves are, not, are now using uh, deep fakes uh, in order to, 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 to steal money, basically. So what, what they did here is quite interesting is that uh, they mimicked basically the voice of uh, the CEO of a company in, in the UK, and then uh, they called like uh, employees, and then they ordered them uh, to, uh, to wire some money to a, to a Hungarian bank, bank account, and they did it because of obviously it was the CEO, and they could basically make 200,000 euros uh, based on this. So uh, this is something that is start, uh, starts actually to be used by uh, very smart thieves. And um, this is also a very, very uh, hot topic now. Facebook released this data set two months ago or something. So also, if you're trying to search for a... Uh, topic of a PhD, I would really recommend you to work on this um, because we actually don't have a good understanding whether we can design models that can detect basically whether, um, whether a, 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 a video is an original video or a deep fake. Okay? So we don't know yet. 
So uh, if you can design a model that can detect whether an, an, uh, a video is original or a deep fake, then that's, that's countering the problem, right? Until someone finds a better deep fake and so on, obviously. OK, so I, I guess I'll conclude here. So um, uh, the, the main takeaways is that there are very simple strategies to fool your classifier. We have seen like adversarial, geometric, universal perturbations, and so on. And uh, adversarial training is really one of the best uh, current techniques to improve your robustness of machine learning models. It has, the, it has really the, the problem of um, efficiency, but we have seen that you can, you can deal, deal with this by studying the geometry of, of the decision boundaries of deep neural networks and understanding what the curvature looks like and so on. Um, so uh, I, I think there are many exciting areas one can, can work on, uh, this, like uh, other than the ones I mentioned already. But uh, even in simple regimes, we actually don't have a good uh, um, defense for. So I presented, for example, universal perturbations, which is this excessively simple perturbation regime that fools your classifiers, and this is still an open problem. So how can you defend against uh, universal perturbations? It's still an open problem. So I think that one has to start with these simple regimes if we are to really solve the, 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 um, the, the bigger problem, which is adversarial perturbations and even more complicated perturbations. In many cases, we, we don't care too much about the L2 norm and the LP norm perturbations, but we care about things that are more, um, you know, adapt to the, to, the, to the application that you care about. So obviously, this depends on the specification that you care about. Uh, so what is the right norm that we should measure our robustness in? This is also an open problem. Um, and obviously, if we are to move forward and implement these things in, in aircrafts and really like safety critical applications, we have to have provable guarantees. Right? And this is really where um, mathematics should come in. And you, you cannot just provide an empirical guarantee that, OK, this works on a set of attacks, and that's fine. You sh should really uh, try as much as possible to provide bounds on this. Currently, the, the bounds that we have in this area are actually very, very pessimistic in the sense that they are giving you bounds, but they are bounds that are useless in, or like not very useful in practice. Okay? So this is also a, a very important area of research. With that, I'll conclude. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Now, it's time for some questions, and I will ask the first question. Okay. I happen to be here. I did my PhD on robust control. Yes. What we did was that when you say a universal perturbation, yeah. it's an impossible problem. So you have, you, like you have structured uncertainty and you have unstructured uncertainty. The more uh, you know about the structure of your perturbation, or thing, then the better performance you can get. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, you guys have a lot to learn from our robust control area and yes. H-infinite optimal control area, yes. and I see a good overlap yes. here. Yes, yes. OK, so we'll so take a few questions. OK. Yes. Did you check, like, uh, or did you look at the latent space, uh, like projected those adversarial perturbations into any of the latent spaces you are constructing? Maybe they are correlated with those latent spaces, like I'm just making it up, but a scale of, or, you know, a multiple of those, so they are then really effective in changing the classification output. I'm just really making it up, but did you? So, so I guess by length and space, you mean actually the features, yes, like intermediate the features exactly, of the convenience, uh -huh. yeah. Um, it's, uh, we have looked quickly at this, and uh, you don't actually see a very specific pattern in the sense that, okay, at this layer, things start to get broken. You know, like you have actually an increase of the distance between the, 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 uh, the features, but you don't really say, okay, at this, at this, you don't have a discrete thing that, okay, at this layer, things get, get broken. It seems to be a, a gradual thing. So, but beyond this, it's actually very hard to, to interpret this. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like project the images onto the latent space, project these adversarial perturbations to that space. Was there any, like... So project, you mean like feed forward? 
feet, like yes, feet, forward, feet forward, yeah, exactly, huh? yeah, yeah. That's that's the distance I'm talking about. So uh -huh. like you 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 have your original image, uh -huh. and then you have your image plus perturbation, yeah. and then you 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 basically feed forward both, yeah. and then you look at the distance yes. between here and there. Yeah. That's the distance I'm talking about. That is, it should be small. Uh -huh. Ideally, it should be small. I, we know that at the end is big, but we don't really know why is it big at the end, mm -hmm. right? So are things breaking in the first layer, second layer? It's unclear. Okay. Yeah. And how a sensitive are they to the size of the training? Because if you take a subset of the training, yeah. are they changing a lot? People have, I mean, this was like in 2016, there has been like uh, probably tens of papers that make it better, basically. And uh, even some people have done, have desi designed perturbations that don't require any training data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very strong evolution. Okay, from students. Any student who wants to ask a question? Okay, anybody? Okay, welcome. Uh, great talk, thanks a lot. Uh, are there any differences on the uh, robustness uh, against adversarial perturbances depending on the implementation of the neural network, the mathematical model yeah. at the underlying hardware level? Oh, hardware level. So, uh, well, I mean, at, at the very basic, because neural network models are not perfect. Yeah. They are abstraction. There are lots of mathematical simplification versus a natural neural network. So those so, simplification may be causing unexpected errors, especially when they are implemented at different uh, complexity, like uh, how many accurate bit accuracy they accept, uh, okay. all those type of things. So just to understand, so natural neural network, you don't mean natural as in biological, right? You mean like natural uh, as I in... I mean biological. Ah, you mean biological. Because the, you okay. compare, like when you give the school bus example, yeah. uh, where, and the brain is yeah. kind of eliminating that type of yes. per uh, perturbation. Yes. Uh, there are lots of unknown mechanisms how the brain works. Yes. So exactly. if you're taking neural network implementations on the like the very simple, like the best one is uh, Isikevich model, for example. Yeah. Those mathematical abstractions are sometimes the root cause of problems. Yeah, but this so we don't have a better model currently. I mean, at least like. These things, they don't work well in practice. So the reason why we work with these mathematical models is that, is that they work well in practice, right? They can be trained. They can be trained fast on hardware and so on. So that's really what we work on because they just work. Now, they work on the practical problems. Now, if we take a very simple problem and a toy problem, maybe this, these like, uh, more mathematical approaches will actually work well on these toy problems. But nobody really cares, right? Because at the end of the day, we, we care about solving like, uh, you know, like uh, natural image data sets. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? <laughs> then you. Thank you. Great talk. So um, when you showed us what the um, universal perturbations you have discovered, um, I was thinking when you train your networks to be you know, like robust to those perturbations. What if you add the universal perturbations to your network and then it can be universally robust to those perturbations? Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that'd be nice, but it's not. Because uh, there are many universal perturbations. So if you add one universal perturbation, it will find you a, a one that is orthogonal to it or roughly right. orthogonal. So it's a whole spectrum. Yeah, exactly. It will, it will basically, there are infinitely many universal perturbations. And once you're, uh, you're robust to one, you're basically still not robust to that. Do you other. think the space is spanned by a particular number of perturbations, like universal ones? Like you can just pin them down and then all other universal perturbations are spanned from those components. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I take universal perturbations, they're going to span the whole space, right? So, so you mean the span in the vector space uh, setting? Yeah, yeah, so we're going to take universal perturbations, and they're roughly, they're not, they're lo they're not linearly dependent, so, so you will actually span the whole space. But the, 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 the thing is, how big is this subspace, right? How big is this subspace of, uh, of universal perturbations? It's very big. Uh, it's, it's very big. So um, you can find very diverse universal perturbations. OK, before I take another question, looks like here, all the question, you are getting stuck with noise. In, yeah. in H infinity optimal control and model reduction, we used to look at Hanka singular values. Uh -huh. So you are really getting stuck with details and missing the big picture. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you have to find a way of model reduction yeah. and identify what your real 
thing that you are trying to identify yes. and that, then you will remove all this nonsense. Yes, but uh, so I, I think there is a, an extra difficulty with respect to, uh, to classical control is that uh, classical uh, this is not linear, robust. Uh, I mean, what we are doing here is that we are learning Yes. The, whole, the whole thing, right? Yes, so we don't know what will actually be learned. Whereas in, in the case of... In automatic control, so somehow you are learning, right? This feedback and things like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so there was a question here. Okay, microphone. Uh, hi. Uh, firstly, for, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, it's really awesome subject, I think. Uh, my question is about uh, verification of the neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, in some areas like, uh, for example, aerospace, uh, the output of the uh, neural network uh, is very important and uh, sensitive, actually. Um, and uh, my question is about uh, how can we choose, uh, if you could choose the basis of the network like the basis of the data, uh, we can uh, do really very good general generalization about the data, but uh, in neural networks today, uh, if our input uh, is a little bit different, uh, the neural network can give really uh, unexpected results, and uh, we cannot trust uh, the networks uh, in this uh, time. Uh, is there any way uh, to increase the generalization capability of the neural networks, uh, for example, in the regression? Uh, like you show uh, in uh, some images, images, um, the output of the network uh, is really uh, very wrong, actually, and uh, we can it's very wrong. identify. I mean, it just uh, fails. Not yeah. Network fails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any so way to increase the generalization yeah, yeah. capability of the uh, networks in the regression? Actually, my question is uh, in the regression, not in classification. You mean? Yeah. I mean. It's, <clears throat> I mean, it's the whole point of machine learning. I mean, the, the whole point of machine learning is generalization, right? Yeah. So um, if there is an easy solution, um, yeah, the, the, we basically don't have a solution currently. But uh, th this is, yeah, this is still an open problem. That's Big opportunity open. for, for, uh, for all of you. Students. Exactly. I will yeah. take one more question. Last question. Who wants to ask the last, last question? Okay. Uh, it seems like uh, the problem, uh, adversary problem, is uh, the number of uh, unknown variables in the network. If we decrease the number of variables in the ne network using dropouts, uh, it can be a solution or not. So dropout is going to randomize your network. So, um, and this has been tried as a, as a potential way of, you know, like getting probabilistic outputs. Um, it's unfortunately not the case that uh, the um, you know through uh, through max um, uh, through max uh, voting, for example, you don't actually get the right class. So in other words, in other words, the diversity that is introduced with dropout is not going to help you in order to improve your robustness to adversarial perturbations. Uh, there is no direct link between the number of uh, unknowns, the number of weights and the robustness to adversarial perturbations. What has been actually shown is the opposite, in the sense that when you make your network more robust, uh, more um, deeper, you're actually getting better robustness to adversarial perturbations. So it's not the other way around, but this is still very early empirical findings. So this is not something like uh, theoretical at this stage yet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.